And I'm here at Blue Wire Studios at the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas. And I have an old friend, and this is one of my favorite things to do on the playbook, to see and witness success. You know, it takes time to be an overnight success. Matt Bailey, founder and CEO of Game On. He is here, and the game is on here on the playbook. How are you doing, Matt? I'm excellent. Thanks for having me, Dave. This is a, a beautiful studio, and, and I'm glad to, to share it with you. It's good to be back in person. Yeah, it's great to see you back in person. And, you know, I really wanted to have you on because I think you have the most to give to my audience because you are the epitome, the stereotype of the transition and the growth and the acceleration, persistent, consistent <laughs> pursuit of your potential. Uh, you and I met when you first started Game On. And it was just almost an imaginary, imaginary idea, a referral of a friend of mine who thought the world of you. And I told the people around me the first time I heard about Game On, I said, this is going to be a success. And they're like, why do you think so? I said, Matt Bailey. And I bet on the jockey, not the horse. And there's been a lot of evolution uh, in your business. Uh, you've been able to raise over $5 million. Uh, you're having great successes with teams, leagues, organizations. You know, what was it that kept you going? Because I know it wasn't always easy. It still isn't easy, but it wasn't always easy when nobody was believing. Yeah, I mean, so many things. Um, you know, the, the, the first time I heard you say the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential, yeah, that really has stuck with me um, because it's, it's, it's not easy. And the number one thing um, is to just keep going, to keep finding a way, uh, because there are there are lows, there there are tough times that you have to grind through, and I think the number one reason why Game On is still here and doing better than we ever have before is that we just kept finding a way, uh, and understanding that, you know, understanding that you're going to get a, a hell of a lot of no's, and being okay with with no's and rejection, and you know, it often takes a hundred no's to get a yes, and that's investors, partners, you know, whatever it might be uh, that, that you're selling. So I think the number one thing is that we just kept going, we kept finding a way. And the root of that, I think, comes back to working in sales before entrepreneurship. And that's, that's one thing that I always recommend to young founders, college founders uh, that, that are still really early is get, get a sales job before you, before you, you know, start your startup because that gives you the pain tolerance uh, for rejection and you will always keep finding a way to, to make it happen. Yeah, I would say either uh, get into sales or ask a whole lot of girls to go out with you looking <laughs> like me and you'll learn how to take rejection. <laughs> well, really that's well. sales, right? Exactly, it is sales. But beyond sales too, uh, you have an uh, uncanny ability of articulating value. And uh, as you know, the better you get at articulating value, the more you can exceed the value that you're asking for, which creates a great mathematical equation of success. One of the more difficult things that I see for entrepreneurs that you've handled brilliantly is there's a balance between the amount of time, energy, emotion, attention, and intention that you put into investors. And you have such an extraordinary retail investor community, uh, very aligned with the core values and the value of the company, but also balancing that with building a business. Mm. You're extraordinary at business development, channel partnerships, customer base and community. How have you been able, timing wise, to know when to prioritize the retail investment side compared to growing the business? That's definitely a new challenge uh, since going public just in, in June of, of this year is that a lot of my role now is the capital markets, uh, but I'm embracing it. It's, it's just like on the business side, uh, on the capital market side, it's still a people relationship business and authenticity is, is really important. For, for example, you know, I'm out here in Vegas to, to do this with you, but I actually knew that one of our retail investors was based here in Las Vegas. So despite us having, you know, tens of thousands of, of investors in our investor base, uh, you know, I, knew, I wanted to go and meet that one. You know, I was in Vegas, so why not go and meet him? We had lunch yesterday. We didn't even talk about the business. We just got to know each other better. And he sent me an email right after saying, hey, Matt, sorry I, I spoke the whole time. Sorry we didn't get to your business. Um, you know, next time I promise plenty of time. And I said, it's totally okay. We got, I wanted to meet you. Uh, it doesn't always have to be business. And I think that 
rings rings true to people. I think the connecting with people on a human level first and foremost is really important. And I'm trying to do more and more of that on the retail investor side, but then on the business side and keeping that balance, I think it's really important to have a great team around you. So since going public in June and, and raising the, that you know $5.8 million, we grew the team. We were three back then, we're now 18 full-time now, and I have incredible leaders running point uh, on certain disciplines. Like you know, our chief product officer uh, was head of sports at Dapper Labs where he conceived and, and built NBA Top Shot, uh, which is you know one of the biggest NFT uh, products in the world. Uh, so now he's quarterbacking our product and doing an incredible job. I don't need to be in those weeds. Same as our engineering manager, same as our VP of partnerships who, my background is, is sales and I was running sales for Game On for so long, uh, but more recently we brought on a guy called Ryan Nowak comes from Madison Square Garden where he sold across the Knicks and the Rangers and the arena itself. He's now running point on partnerships. So a big part of, of the continuing business being successful despite the investor part of the business needing attention is those great leaders uh, running point. And you know, asking for help and securing great leadership is so important, but there's a natural uh, love affair that we have when there's three employees, when it's our baby. Mm. And I have been blessed with the experience of sending uh, two of my kids off to college and one has graduated college. And I know for a fact that as I've scaled businesses to the thousands of employees, one of the most difficult challenges was giving up the babysitting responsibilities or control of my babies, um, including my daughters. For you, how difficult was it to let go of your baby and allow people that may have even more situational knowledge, experience and expertise than you to do it their own way, to provide their own perspective on what was before really your baby. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that was a challenge. Uh, and the shifting responsibilities of, you know, the business of what it is today, being a public company, what my role had become. And then I really embraced the opportunity to learn a new role and do something different. And, and that, what, that is what ultimately drove me to, to be okay with it. But then I also realized, you know, as CEO of a public company, a growing company, you know, my job isn't to be the smartest guy in the room. It's to inspire and motivate the smartest guys in the room. And I embrace that and I love that. And, and it makes me so happy now to have my catch-up calls and meetings with my leadership group and see them having conversations and making product decisions without me having you know, very little input, that makes me so happy today. So That's awesome. Now, I want to give people a little bit of perspective on how a company evolves and ideas change and circumstances obviously have changed for everyone on earth with COVID and the pandemic, but yet you're able to raise over $5 million in March during the pandemic. What was the original idea that you had for Game On? What is the idea today, and what do you think the idea will be three years from now? Yeah, so we originally launched three years ago as a B2C-focused prediction game product that you could download, make prediction on the NBA, NFL, all, all the different leagues, uh, and maybe win some cash prizes. We just wanted to be a part of the predictive gaming, sports betting uh, wave that was happening in North America. That's what we did first, but then... Pretty quickly over time, we've evolved into a completely B2B focused business. So using the same technology, we're now working with leagues, tournaments, sports books, teams to make their content more engaging and social through gamification and predictive gaming, white label technology. So we, we no longer, uh, you, know, you can no longer download Game On on the App Store, but instead you can go and uh, experience our technology through partners like NBC Universal, MX Player in India, Willow TV. Our newest partner is an NFT uh, collection called Chibi Dinos. Uh, you can now uh, work, experience Game On through their NFT collectibles. Um, so that's what we're doing today, and, and that actually happened, or that, that evolution came through COVID. Uh, sports kind of fell off the edge of the earth at one point, and there were no sports to predict. Uh, so we, had, we needed to survive. We had no money in the bank. I hadn't paid myself for over a year. Uh, and then the, you know, we needed to generate revenue fast. NBC Universal were our first partner to say, yes, we'll do it. It was actually for the Real Housewives. Uh, so we created the official prediction game for the Real Housewives, 
money was in the bank right away, and I was like, wow, you know, we can generate money in a much more transactional nature by being a B2B business, and it just snowballed from there. Now we, we're working on 10 active projects right now with uh, businesses and companies in not only North America, but India, uh, with the Cricket World Cup that's on right now. We have two products out there. We're working with you know, companies in Australia and Europe. Uh, so that was the original uh, catalyst, was COVID, and being able to kind of ride the wave, uh, be flexible, go where the market was pulling us, and now we're fully focused on it, which has been the, the best move and decision we've ever made. And where do you see yourself three years from now? Uh, I see us hopefully with not just 10 projects, but hundreds of projects, uh, a growing team, uh, and a burgeoning uh, public you know, company. I hope we, we eventually uplist to, to, from the CSE in, in Canada to one of the bigger exchanges here in North America, and I, I hope that we're continuing to grow the business. And I always say, you know, life is about lessons. The lessons keep on coming until we learn them. Uh, pain is an indicator. Setbacks, failures, et cetera, are indicators that we have a better place to be. One of the more difficult things to understand as an entrepreneur, you understand the gaming, the gamification, the white label business that you have. I can see an extreme knowledge of how your business has evolved, where the industry, careers, jobs exist, opportunities in this B2B play. Uh, but I always say, uh, in the public markets, you know, as we move to bigger exchanges, that one of the biggest lessons or biggest pains, struggles, mistakes, and failures I had was understanding that difference of market making, of you know, investor relations, uh, retail investment itself, understanding you know the shareholder value versus uh, a personal interest. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these different lessons I've learned is being a CEO of a public company and being on boards of public companies and advisor to public companies. For you, how and what are you doing in order to accelerate that learning curve? What types of things are you doing to learn about the market, the market makers, the IR side of things? Because unlike sales being completely attributable to building a business, scaling a business, being successful in the business, I believe that it's a whole different ball game, no pun intended, mm. uh, to be in the public markets. Uh, and what is support or assistance are you getting? The first thing I did was surround myself with people who have that experience. This is my first public venture. Uh, my first, it's my first startup, let alone public <laughs> venture. So uh, I knew that I couldn't do this without the right people. So the first, per first person I got on board with us well, is our chairman. His name's Jay Moses. He greenlit the original Grand Theft Auto back in the day, and he's still a director on the board of Take-Two Interactive, one of the biggest uh, gaming public companies in the world. So he is a big part of it. He's a mentor, he's a friend, he's, he's my chairman, uh, and he's helped me in not a lot, not only personally, but obviously professionally. He's not your typical chairman. He's in the business every day. He's calling me every day. He's, he's helping me make decisions. He's making introductions. So... Uh, he was a big part of it, but then our biggest shareholder, Victory Square Technologies, have a portfolio model. They're also public, uh, and they uh, work with 20-plus startups to go down this route that we've gone to, to gain access to capital, and they bring a lot of the expertise with them. So a lot of the IR stuff, a lot of the financial regulatory stuff, they're bringing all of that support, and without them, you know, it would be impossible to do what we're doing today. So it was really important to just surround myself with people that I can kind of be a sponge, soak up so much and learn from them. So some of that sales skill did help out in convincing some of these extremely successful people that sit in a situation you want to be in with the situational knowledge to 100%. help you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then beyond that too, asking for help, where are some other areas that you suggest, you know, startups, since this is your first startup and a successful one, looking backwards, where would you suggest startups to ask for help? Where are some of the places that you learned, wow, I didn't know this existed, or man, if I had it to do it again, I would ask these people for help. I think first and foremost, you need to understand and be real with yourself about where your strengths and weaknesses are, then find people to, to complement that. So I, I did that from the start, really. Um, you know, the, I had two advisors on as soon as I wrote the business plan, 
One is, is my good friend, mentor, Shauna Griffiths, uh, who read the, simply read the, the business plan and gave me the confidence to then do something about it. And along the way, I've added advisors that just complement the, the, the current team. So I think that's what's most important. There, there isn't anything specific that you know, anyone listening should go and find. First, they should look at themselves uh, you know, be real. Like I said, our job as founders or entrepreneurs or as CEOs isn't to be the smartest guy in the room or to to be you know to be competent in every single discipline. It's about to, it's about being good at what you know you're good at and knowing what you don't know and finding advisors to kind of compliment you. So that's the that's the number one thing. And I think I did that well from from the start. Last question. You know, while you're building a business, you get a lot of no's. And I think understanding and having a relationship with no, knowing that the people that say no to you make you, and the people say that yes with you uh, necessarily aren't in necessarily your best interest. Uh, I always wonder, you know, when I have elevated, you know, the brand that I have and the significant I have, that sometimes when I was watching, you know, athletes that work with me, they would say the same thing to people that I would say, but it would really hurt the person because, oh my gosh, Warren Moon said he didn't like my dress. And he was just kidding. And if I was just kidding and said, you know, I don't like your gray T-shirt or, you know, <laughs> do you buy those shoes on sale? You would laugh because it's David Meltzer. But you forget that people think highly of you. Mm. Do you remember during the course of the nose, was there anyone that you hyper-respected or you really wanted to be a partner or an investor, but yet they had a closed mind, they just weren't ready, right time, emotion, or value, and there no actually had an impact on you that you had to overcome other than other no's were just in the litany of no's. Was there someone or some uh, group that you think of that, you know, gosh, I can't, you know, just burn me or, or hurt me so bad? I think, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't startup related. It was before that. It was when it was I... your wife. No, <laughs> my fiance. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, so she, uh, Actually, she's one that I always have to say, like, when people say no, sometimes she gets a little bit upset. I'm like, don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, my it. wife's super <laughs> defensive of me. I get it. She can't read the comments in my Instagram. <laughs> it hurt her feeling. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I'm going to go back to, to eight years ago when I moved from Australia to New York with no, with no job, nothing set up. I just, I was 22, one-way ticket. And I, when I look back, I'm like, it's pretty, it's pretty insane that I did yeah. that. Uh, but I just landed in New York, and I wanted to work in the major leagues. So with very little on the resume, just started applying for you know the Knicks, the Nets, the the Rangers, the NFL. Got nothing back, like not even not even a, a whisper back uh, from hundreds of, of of resumes being submitted, and that hurt. I think that was the first. At that point, no's and rejection hurt a lot, um, but pushed through. Uh, ended up uh, a few years later working for the Brooklyn Nets uh, just because of the persistence and turning up every day and turn and just yeah turning up every day and eventually grinding and getting there. Um, so that that was harder when I first got to New York, getting a lot of rejection and uh, running out of money and potentially having to go back to Australia. Uh, that was hard, but then pushed through, got the result, uh, and then by the time I got to to start up land, I was totally fine with nose. In fact. I love no. I do too. <laughs> it's, it's the next best thing to a yes. <laughs> and a drawn out, a long drawn out no is the worst. And uh, even worse is, so, is silence. So I love a good fast no. Yeah, that's so. why I have a three no rule and I call it a universal three no rule, meaning even a call, no call back is a no to me. So yeah. <laughs> I'm like you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Matt Bailey, our founder and CEO of Game On, for teaching us one of my favorite playbooks to success being and enjoying the consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of your potential. And I can't wait to see and continue to witness the great pursuit of the great potential that you, Matt Bailey, and Game On have. Thank you so much for joining me. This is David Meltzer live from the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, Blue Wire Studios with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.